Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. This is part four, the, the final in the, the little arc on looking at saturation devices. And again, just really clarifying, these are saturation devices, so they are to fill that hole that people perceive is, is lost when we don't have analog gear. Now, the, the piece, of, piece of gear that I've, I've sort of boiled this all down to in a myth, mythologizing sort of a way is, is a Neve desk. The idea being that we plug something into a Neve and suddenly we get this extra little bit of magic. Uh, and a good saturation device does actually deliver that. Uh, and um, this is probably my favorite of the lot, even though I'm yet to put it in a mix. There are just a few things about this that are very, very interesting. And if they actually pan out in a mix, I think really rather exciting. The last one we looked at was uh, IVGI from Klanghelm, which was a different flavor from these. Now this is able to provide some similar sort of flavor, uh, but it also does something which I really look for in, um, in this kind of plugin. Let's have a quick AB. So this is the device running with defaults on everything, except we are using the tube mode, my preferred mode. We'll run through the options soon. Let's turn them off. Oh, quite a difference. Now there's a little bit of level gain there, but there's also a lot of, ooh. Now one of the differences here is that with this device, it's able to operate in a group, which means that when I'm pressing this one button here, all of these are turning themselves off individually. You see that with all the others, I've had to go flick, 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 flick to get each of them off individually. Whereas this is allowing me to actually turn them all on or off, as in to make my mythical Neve appear or disappear across the board, which is actually a very, very interesting feature. It has three characters being an op amp, a transistor and a tube, and it also adds a little bit of hiss. On the surface, it sounds like a bad thing, but in reality, it's actually rather a good thing. So where's it come from? It comes from Hornet. Hornet's a small player, but he, I think it's one fellow out of uh, Italy, and he has a lot of product uh, and an interesting approach. It's an approach we're seeing from a few minor developers and I actually quite like to see it. He's got his own character and his own approach. He can be a little technical, um, but overall his products look quite good. I spent some time looking at his uh, analog e EQ, which in many ways I rather liked, but at least in the t at that time in reason it did not behave well which stopped me from using it. Uh, but price-wise, it's, it's um, you know, really rather good. At 17.99 euro, so 18 euro, which is gonna translate to 20 or so dollars US, you're getting a lot of product that's pretty darn well thought through with a feature that, um, while not unique, puts it outside of what most other contenders are doing. He's quite clear. He says he's got these three different types of emulation and that the whole idea is to, to recreate as though we had these desks. So it falls right into the concept of having that mythical Neve. There is a video. Now his presentation and along with his website are prone to being a little characterful uh, and his video is rudimentary. Um, a little bit agricultural, one might say. Um, I would like to see him learn the joys of OBS, but, you know, the thing is, if you're interested, if you actually watch, it's a little long, as are my videos, as, as any video should be, if it's looking deep into something, then you really get to see in detail how things work. He's got a scope that he uses, which is way more detailed than, than what I use. I think it might be something that's in logic, don't know care really but there is a there's a good explanation here and because he understands not only his what he's doing 
he, he's able to explain it reasonably well. He's not a you know science presenter, no Carl Sagan, but uh, nonetheless, they're they're all positive things about who he is and and what he's doing. A lot of product, not a lot of money, lots of different options. Perhaps some products maybe are a little less necessary than others, but it focuses on a that sort of mindset, wanting these things. I would not say go out and buy everything of his. I think it would become a little pointless, um, which is a thing that I say with every manufacturer who offers a let's buy the whole bundle. But if there are particular things, solutions that you find useful, then I think that he's got some really, really clever little products in there. This one has definitely, definitely gotten me somewhat excited. Uh, all right, let's move forward to have a look at the product. We shall scoot down to my synth. You might notice this is a little different. My sine wave synth is looking a little different because we're going to show you a couple of other things and I'm trying to show you what he does and how he does it, which is actually surprisingly difficult without a scope as interesting as his. So let's open up the unit up here so we can see on my scope you can see what's happening with the the plugin but i've modified or i've copied most of the knobs into a combinator in case you're wondering what is that so you can see what's being done it's just been macroed so that we can automate with these knobs you can see a little bit of uh, harmonic happening there on the the transient but interestingly nothing otherwise if we open this back up, if we push drive, we can see this grow. Now that's in the tube mode, but we can't see a lot. And so you wonder why do we get such a dramatic difference when I AB'd? Well, one was because one button was handling all those ABs, but there's a lot of brightness that comes in there as well. The beautiful sparkle, what better it likes. So where, where's that? I'm not seeing it here, but it is there. If we look at boosting our level, there you'll see that we've added a casual 24 dB, which I've stripped. That's just to push the plug-in. We can now see a couple more harmonics. If we go harder, it's now very much in the realms of distortion, but you can see these harmonics moving in and out until we get to the point where it just goes, oh, no, that's, that's enough of that. Now, the options that we have in terms of how it sounds is we've got these different models. They are built around particular components. The op amp is the, the modern desk and surprisingly clean. That crackle is just digitally coping with things. very clean and tidy. There is some hiss, but we can't see it. It's like 90, minus 90 something dB. Very, very quiet, which is actually really good. So it's it's clean, but adding that little tiny bit of hiss does add some value. So hiss or no hiss, you're not gonna notice any difference. Even with lots and lots of channels, you will probably not notice any difference there at all. We've then got the age slider. As components age, as physical components age, they t their tolerances and their performance, their behavior tends to change a little bit. Normally, not for the better. And so the age slider here is used as a way to change how those overtones are created which is a reminder as to why, if we have physical gear, it should be serviced every few years. Because if we look at from zero to five, we've got a marked difference. You might go, oh, but that's too small to make any difference, but we can hear a pretty noticeable difference in there. So the op amp is the cleanest with the most ordered uh, and yeah, tidy overtones. This is obviously operating as a full-on distortion unit at the moment. Transistor. 
You see, not quite so tidy. That's the chimey sort of square wave kind of thing. This has got some other things happening in the middle, so gets kind of thicker. See how this overtone is a lot closer. The first overtone here is up here. So that's probably second harmonic, which is explaining the square wavy feel. Whereas this one is probably first harmonic, second harmonic is noticeably quieter. So it's going to musclify the sound, which is largely what IVGI was doing a lot of. There are obviously more overtones as we go up a little bit more, but most of his emphasis is here. See how as we push it, there's not a lot of difference between this and this. So it's like having your singer and then having another singer sing almost as loudly behind him. Suddenly he gets thicker. So, transistor and then my fave, tube, which has a lot of strength here, but also has a lot more going on up at the top. Becomes more noticeable as we age. Also, as we age, you see how this fundamental gets quieter. Doesn't change much in the op amp ultimately changes quite a lot with the transistor, but doesn't suffer quite as quickly. And the tube, which has got this close harmonic, but it's also got a lot more up top. Now you can't see it, but in his video, you can see quite a lot of little spikies right up here. Um, he's, his uh, meter is probably reading at minus 100 and something dB or whatever, and you might think, but if they're down there, we're never going to hear them. No, you sort of don't, but you're very aware of them. So, what we've got are these three strong flavors. Tube, op amp, transistor. On the surface, you think, but there's not a big difference, but when you put them into a mix, you'll notice quite a big difference. He has a gain and auto gain, so we can set our gains manually. Now this is obviously pushed, well, rather, rather hard. We can change our gain to say, well, this is where I want it to be. In theory, we would be exactly there. The limit on his system is that there's no way to fix that gain on the out, out. Now, I have been pretty forward about that on all of the others, so in some ways I should be as forward on this, but you know what, it doesn't bother me as much on this, oddly enough. Um, yeah, in theory it would be nice to have a, a knob or a button that fixes it, but for some reason it doesn't bother me as much on this. Quite why, I'm not so sure. Um, Maybe it's just because it's giving me exactly what I want in terms of flavor. I don't know. So if you notice the inconsistency, I don't really have a clear answer. Now, the other thing that he has got here is, let's push that up. If our signal's coming in, we can hit the auto gain, and it works out where that signal should be to give it the perfect gain stage. Whether that's a good idea or not, ultimately, I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty confident I probably wouldn't really be using that feature. However, for a lot of people who haven't learned, honestly, I would say you really should learn because this is, should be a manual process, but nonetheless, it is interesting. Rather than us having to try to work out where it is, he has sort of made it really pretty darn clear that even if this were not a learning tool, remember with the IVG, I was frustrated with the meters because they didn't tell me where they should be, how they should sit. If we have a more complex signal, the auto gain will work it out and it actually looks like it peaks more here than up here. So where I was left trying to guess with IVG, I, I don't need to guess with this. I can use the auto gain, but Probably I wouldn't, because I would still rather set it myself, but at least I know what the plugin 
would want in its idealized world. And that is that we'd be peaking at zero dB, not sort of going over the top. But in reality, learning means that I learn to listen and some things I will push in hard. Some things I will pull, push in real soft, you know, because that's how I'm going to get the sound I want. Uh, certain digital synthesizers in particular can distort very, very quickly if you push them in at some sort of perfect idealized thou shalt level. So doing the thou shalt level is a really bad plan. So you know and you find the point where they are comfortable. The auto gain is really very interesting. You can set where you want that to be and you can get into groups. Uh, or you can set what you want as your as your headroom. So you can auto gain and it will um, change to, to sort of different amounts. It's not as well explained in the manuals as one might hope for, the same with the age thing, but you work it out fast enough. Uh, as long as you know your theory, and if you don't know your theory, I question the wisdom of using a device. You can double click to send things back to zero. Now groups, this is where this plugin, apart from its sound, really, really shines. See how with the, the whole mix, I press one button and all the other plugins kind of turn themselves off. You can put things into a group. Now every other instance of this that has been put into the group will then follow just about all the moves that you make here. And that is really good. Oh, you can see our hiss here. See how it's showing at minus 100 dB? Turn it off, goes away. This is going, well, yeah, is there or is there not a signal here? That's, that's really nice. It's very low. Uh, there's no cause to be adding much more hiss. I have done it. Sometimes a mix can sound really nice with the add more hiss, but you know that's, that's getting into something a little bit different from this. So your group, let's have a look at it here. If we open a pair of these, let's put our reverb over here and let's open our master here. Let's actually reopen our reverb. So now we've got the two of these and these are both in group one. If I'm listening to my tube mode and say, yeah, I'm not sure whether that's the one I want. Let's try the op amp. See how this one has moved as well. If I age my console, everything follows. If I change my headroom, everything follows. Turn my saturation off, turn my hiss off, everything follows. If I auto gain here, this is not following. However, it's possible to make it follow. And this is the reason you may have noticed that the reverb just grew. This is part of why auto gain is not automatically in the group, because it's probably a, an unwise idea. Uh, we'll look at that when we get to the reverb, the idea of using the auto gain to give ourselves the apparently perfect level, but we create a whole other issue. So the fact that we can put things into groups and control everything gives us something that is almost 100% missing in the door market. There have been a couple of people who've tried to do this with varying degrees of success. Um, the uh, Britson Satson, I can't remember the name, the developer uh, saturation units saw this problem and tried to create a solution. So their solution was that you would put a sort of a sender on each of your tracks and then on your bus or your master you would put a receiver and then you could control certain things at the sender point and certain things at the receiver point but you know what it's a pain it's just a pain full points for trying to find a solution but they didn't find the most elegant solution they did have they do have options with regards to groupings and what have you but Somehow it just feels painful. Cakewalk were one of the first manufacturers that I know of to try to put in something that seems like let's make our door desk feel like a analog desk. They called it the Pro Channel. 
But then they stopped at that point, which struck me as very sad. I understand that they didn't think past that because it wasn't until I saw somebody else, um, Studio One, do it that I realised that's blindingly obvious. And I'm amazed that someone like Reason hasn't done this. But the problem with the um, the pro channel in, um, in, in Cakewalk, Cakewalk by Bad Lab, Sonar, uh, was that it was still just adding a plugin. You had to go and find the plugin and put it in, and you had to choose, am I using the, the channel version or the bus version? And it's like, yeah, but you haven't solved the problem elegantly or in a way that really represents what would happen if we walked into our studio, jacked our Jupiter 8 into our Neve, or for some reason decided we were swapping our Neve this week for an SSL, which would be like everything's jacked right where it was, but suddenly, boom, our Neve becomes an SSL. Because that's something that digital can do, not so easy in the real world, because repatching a desk was, well, not as much fun as you'd hope for. So the solution here is... Yes, coming in third party because they're a VST developer, but the fact that you just jam the same plugin everywhere and then put it into a group. You've got the option for up to eight groups, but as I've advised, you probably want to be careful. You might choose to set group one as being tracks and group two as being buses, but I don't know. I don't know whether it's really necessary. You could, but my advice is always same across the whole board. Because if you have a Neve, and if it's being maintained, every channel, in theory, sounds the same. I don't know whether there's any kind of wander or, or flooping anything in here. The IVGI says that it is constantly moving and flooping itself. Um, this doesn't say whether it does, but it does a beautiful job. Now, the, the solution that is great, uh, although it means you've got to commit to the door, is that in Studio One, Personas very, very wisely said, why don't we just, at the Masters, provide a doohickey where you can say, our mixing desk is now a Neve, or it's now an SSL, or it's now a something or other else. And that populates across the whole thing. And at this point, you, you open that thing, and you make the decisions, and the whole mix changes with it, which is essentially the same as what's happening here. As I say, I think the reason really have missed the boat on that in that they've got this beautiful SSL workflow uh, and they never really realised, hang on, we could actually be inserting sound across all our channels. Uh, the, the, the vague but not complete promise that Harrison have given could or should have been done already. This gets us there and better than any other solution that I have seen with the possible exception of Studio One. Would I buy Studio One for that one feature? No, I don't think so. Would I be happy for a reason to put that feature in here? Oh, hell yes. Uh, and if they were looking for code uh, and that they could just insert, I'd be, go have a chat to Mr. Hornet because I think he's got it pretty well licked. So that is the device. Might as well run through the goods and bads. Good and bad. Well, obviously I like this. I really like the tube. We'll run through the other, the other models as well, but tubey is tubular. The group settings is just a much more elegant solution than anybody else has come up with. Full marks, weird little Italian dude. You might not be any good at videos, but this is a really nice solution on top of a nice plugin that's really cheap. So, absolute winner. Again, I'm just going to add the caveat that I haven't completed a mix with this yet. It's possible I could complete the mix here, be super delighted, go off into the lounge room and listen in the bedroom and go, what went wrong? But I don't think so. I've been doing this long enough that I think that this is a this is a real winner. I really liked the tube amp from Voxengo, but this is better because there's less setup. Well, any setup you do can ripple across your whole mix in one go. Uh, the auto gain is not a thing I intend to use and nor do I strongly encourage it, but the fact that it's there while it can be a massive danger to the unwary and it bothers me 
that, that it is there in that sense, it does at least teach people this is where your target is, seeing there isn't a proper manual that explains this is where your target is and why, and here are the things that you can do, and here's how to really make the most of it. He has gone for the, oh, well, let's just give people want what they think they want, which is the easiest solution, which is probably going to stop them from learning. But nonetheless, the auto gain is a kind of a cool thing. I'm supposed to, to raise a bad. I've already said it. The video is the manual. It's clear, but it's it's kind of scruffy. But so long as you understand what you're doing and you're not misusing that auto gain, there's not really anything to go wrong. Use your ears. Uh, if you are not yet at that point where you have trained yourself to understand, then basically use default settings. You can't really go wrong with this. Now, to the exciting part of the program, if I'm not excited enough already, there's a little bit of hiss, nothing that we need to worry about. Uh, we will run through our mix. Let's have a listen. Here's our device in. Here's all our devices out. We get a really nice sense of punch, movement in the low end. So that's our first harmonic. And this really, what I just adore, sparkle up in the top end. That is really, really just so super. Now, I am going to leave them in a group, but I'm going to turn off each of these individually. A, so it shows you the same as what we've done with everything else. And B, so that we can work on one thing at a time. And we can just feel the, the magic just falling off the mix. You still need to have a good mix. If you've got a poor mix and you just put saturation on it, it's just going to be a shiny poor mix. But if you've got something that vaguely resembles a good mix, you've embiggened it. Let's have a look at our drums. Big spark. Now there is a fair amount of gain on that fella. Let's start with our op amp. We'll look at auto gain to show you how what it's going to do. See, it's mostly peaking at zero, but it did actually allow some overs, although it's not tolerated now. It's still wanting to peak at zero. That tells us it doesn't want to go over. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't go over, but in an ideal, perfect world where it's all being clean, and then it peaks at 0 dB. Fair enough. Good to know. Good to ignore. Let's push this. This is where it does get a little annoying because we don't have an out. We can't adjust our level out. This sounds better because it's loud, but over time, you do learn to hear some of the difference between it's loud and great, and oh, there's an extra something in there, great. So if we pull roughly 11 dB off here, it's, there's no simple way to do this. other than to AB with the saturation on off. Now this is not a form that I particularly dig. Uh, it, it is adding body, but it's leaving our, our tops alone, and that's okay. But it is kind of cool here. We're getting 
quite a lot of clip on our transients. We're pushing them right down. So you can hear a little bit of push, but it's not bad. The older it gets in terms of virtual age, you'll notice that the signal thins down. His logic on that, I'm not sure. Is it because those components lose tolerance and lose their ability to push through such a wide frequency range well? Or is it just based on the logic that when I buy my Rod Stewart record from 1972, it seems to have a frequency range of this. And when I buy a Rod Stewart record from 1983, it has a frequency range of this. And when I buy Rod's current record, it has a frequency range of this. Um, I'm not sure, it's not explained. I, I wouldn't mind an understanding, but it's kind of not bad. I like adding somewhere around five years, but it's a personal choice. This just adds a little bit of oomph. Let's listen to the transistor. It adds a, um, a little bit of crunch and a, and a little bit more thickness to that. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, that's all going to depend on your mix. Again, it thins with age. But those first two models just aren't what I'm looking for in saturation. I'm not gonna say they're bad, I'm looking for this. Because not only we're we getting that whoop as we've got that first harmonic, we're getting a lot of sparkle up top. Things that EQ just don't handle the way that I would like them to. This comes down to personal preference. As we move into age, it thins. Hear how that is louder, but when we push this in, it feels thunderous. Thunder. This is how this is done. Uh, a little bit of years. It's a small difference, but it's a massive feel difference. Those little bit of years, yes, they're limiting things down a little, crushing them, both sort of this way in terms of frequency range and also dynamics. Is it good or bad? It's sort of bad, but once you get into a full mix, it's probably also sort of good. Uh, so that makes that drum really, whoa. And that's by pushing in here. And I just adjust my levels to make it feel good in the mix. Is that sort of thunderstruck kind of feel, what this particular mix is looking for. I don't know, probably isn't, in which case I'm gonna say let's let's look at backing it down a little bit. So now we've got a far more relaxed Feel, which fits with the, the jazzy sparkly thing. By still using our saturation, we've pulled it back and our aging also relaxes and pulls everything in. So we can use the saturation to embiggen or we can use the saturation to create a charm that also allows us to pull something back in the mix. 
because if this were jazz, we wouldn't be looking for it to be ACDC. Let's have a look-see at our bass. Go have a look at our op amp. Let's let this age as it wants, or to gain as it wants. It's pulling a lot back. I. It is, it is adding a little bit of body there. I quite like the, the punch that that brings. It brings a lot more body. Again, we've got a question whether it's right for this mix. That's really sounding quite thick. So that's that's nice in its own way. Let's have a look to Mr. Tubi Tube. Again, I like this because it's providing that lower harmonic, but it's the upper. For me, when it adds the the, the first and second harmonics more than anything else, um, or without the top then it just sort of glugs. When it adds that and the top, it's kind of like putting a smiley face on this thing. It's like we get the best of both worlds. So this is why I keep going with the tube. I'm happy to let this go over a little because it's handling some of the transients because there's no compression happening here. Uh, and I don't need to use compression if I can use this to handle some of the transients a little bit as well as giving some character. Again, yeah, we're going to roll off a little bit of some of the everything everything, but I don't see that as entirely a bad thing. So I'm going back to where I was to a fair extent. Let's pop her back in the mix. hearing that wonderful glossy sparkling sound that I so love. Take it off. There's a little bit of distortion creeping in there, but seeing I'm not using anything else, I'm, I'm happy for it to do that. Let's see what Mr. Auto Gain has to say for himself. So that has set those levels. Op amp. Straight away you can hear that shine just leave. That adds a nice sound. The op amp just doesn't do it for me. And this is part of why I think for a lot of years, I resisted the whole saturation thing because I kept being given these sort of more technically perfect things. My fault too, when I was given tube things, was that I would just push them too hard and they go in distortion and I'd be like, why do I want it to sound that bad? It's in knowing that it's the bit that you can't hear where the real magic is. But the transistor is giving me some of the magic that I do like or look forward to. Straight away, all those little sparkly warklies up high. Getting some distortion, but I'm not sure whether it's from the headphones 
or just that we were pushing too hard into the um, into the masters. I think possibly the latter. But there is mileage to be had. There's a lot more flexibility in in drive mileage in this than there is in the um, tube amp. In Voxengo's tube amp, uh, and while it definitely will get into sort of bird territory, it doesn't go over quite the same or as easily as it does with IVGI. That's fully aged. Which is actually a really very pleasing sound. If you want that to sit solidly in the middle of the mix while still seeming to have that, that presence, that actually works out really rather nicely. If we go back to perfect, perfect. Again, it's giving that compression feeling whilst giving a kind of a brightness and that would sit really solidly in the middle of the mix as we have our singer and what have you. So sort of doobies, sticks kind of a, a sound, very, very nice. Let's pop her back in the mix. And our string. We're getting a little bit of level, which is probably this here. But again, as soon as that comes in, that tube just has everything feel like it opens up. That's what I love about this, and the and the um, and the tube amp, that uh, and to a fair extent the um, saturation knob, soft tube saturation knob, is just this feeling that oh everything opens up. It's there. Amp, again, surprisingly clean. That's adding body uh, and, well, a transistory buzziness, uh, which is either terrible or charming. Uh, in the right use in this situation, love, love will tear us apart, then the transistor on the string line would probably be a really, really cool move because that little buzzy is just going to come through so nicely uh, because that's what we're used to in that chances are that was recorded on transistors and then the tube it's it's a little ragged but it's nicely ragged more gary newman ragged narrows down with age we're obviously overdoing it there. It's just adding this nice bigness presence and that's exactly what I hope for in these situations. And notice when it goes back in the mix that string falls right back where it belongs. This string is, is almost a bit more of a cello line underneath the electric piano, filling in around the, the drum and bass, uh, than it is meant to be something sitting on top. And it falls straight back into that, regardless of whether a saturation is there or not. One of the problems with using EQ to get that sparkle is that it can then pull it into the front of the mix. So very, very pleased with that. If we run through our mix as an AB, just popping them in and out.
four all at once. Cool. So the mix feels nicer as a result of this work. Let's go have a look at our reverb, which we need to pull in. Here's our return. So now we're just listening to the reverb. I know this is a wee bit quiet. And this is one of the things where we will look at the auto gain. Should we auto gain this? Oh, it's quiet. We can bring it up to the perfect level. Okay, Mr. Bot tells me that this is the perfect level to get the perfect result. Does it sound good? Now we are adding a lot more body, but we've added a lot of level, which we don't have the option to roll off. Um, and, and yes, I guess the more I use it in this sense, the more that could be annoying. Uh, in which case we've got to go up here. What have we got? 4.5. So assuming that that's actually 4.5 on the way out. Perceptually, I am not sure that that is the case. Let's drag this fella up here. No. So we're peaking at shy of minus 24. That's 20. So we we really need to roll a lot more off. So it's it's kind of messing with our levels, which is in an ideal world would want a knob down here, but because I'm used to this, I cope with it. Uh, but if we were to do it this way, yeah. Now, should you be doing the auto gain thing, assuming that we didn't have, we weren't going to have problems with our reverb changing level? Well, that's going to have to be up to you. It's a personal choice. But I think just be a little careful. You will be changing your reverb sound. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm all for doing that, especially if using a stock standard reverb. Because what's going to happen is that you're going to change and create your own sound. So if I were putting this in at the beginning of a mix where I do put my reverbs in, I don't put them in at the end of a mix. So a client sends me their stuff, I pull it up. First thing I work on once I've got sense of what's happening is the reverb space. This is the space in which this song, this story is going to happen. Uh, then I build a reverb, in which case I might well be saying, yep, let's auto gain this or let's create the space that I want it to be. But to assume that your reverb space should be a certain way at a certain level is possibly a dangerous thing. It just needs to be at the level that the mix wants it to be. So let's for the moment assume even Stephen and pop ourselves back in. Even at even Stephen, because this reverb was already set up and sounded good and what have you, and we don't want to go changing our levels, or at least we're going to have to reassess if we do, then we have got that sense that, oh, the reverb has embiggened. Uh, if we were to, to take it and let it auto gain, I think we're adding roughly 6 dB. The reverb just is different. I'm not going to say whether that's right or wronger. 
it's it's different. So seeing I had a reverb sound I kind of liked and a mix I kind of liked, I don't really want to change that. Whether I could, should, that's going to be up to you. But if you're going to do the auto gain and push your reverb here, my advice, do it at the beginning or do it where and when you set up your reverbs, not after you've finished the mix. Um, I tend to drop in these once I've finished the mix, so that's why my hesitancy to make big changes to the reverb because I've already got a sound I like. While tempting to drop your saturation things in as you make your sound, and it is how it would work if you had a real Neve because you would be jacking all of your Jupiter 8s in, all 23 of them, to your 24 input desk, and therefore you're getting your saturation from the word go. So there's nothing to stop you from doing that. I just tend to be of the, let's make this mix as nice as possible, then let's see how we can embiggen it with saturation. Seeing we have that choice, because back in the Neve days, we didn't have a choice. You know, we couldn't say, I'm going to swap my Neve for an SSL um, or a Tandy <laughs> desk uh, or, or, or an invisible desk, as in one that has no sound, because we just went with the horrible brand Hascam desk that we had. Uh, so the fact that we have a choice in how we saturate, how we colour our mix, I actually see this more as a finalising rather than a, a let's push everything into that from the beginning, because when we come to the end to finalise or master, then we'll have taken all of that for granted, and there's a fair chance that we're actually going to undo that with nasty processing that actually squishes all the beautiful things that this brings. You know, it's like people dump in ozone with like 47 different modules and then still be going, oh, is that enough modules? Now, as you hear, I'm getting a really nice mix with nothing but this one device. Speaking of, we have a mix fully working, fully saturated. And it's working nicely. So now we do get to that final section, which is our master. master in we get quite a quite a jump here and that's what I would expect to get because remember that saturation compounds and part of the joy of it is the compounding nature of it that is different you might go oh but when I put all 47 of those ozone things in they all compound man well yeah but if you're putting in 47 multiband compressors all you're doing is compounding the smash the idea of these units is that they put in sparkle and you can't see. You remember when I'm showing you on the spectrum analyzer there, you can't actually see the sparkly things. You have to go have a look at his video to see the sparkly things floating around in the top there, those extra little transients. Those extra little transients, when you put all kinds of, well, mallets on your masters, they get destroyed. They get crushed. So the whole idea is that I say, let's do this last. This is a part of your master where we say, okay, now how do I want my mix to sound and feel overall? Yeah, okay, I've got a good mix. Now I've got a lovely mix. Do I want it to sound op ampy? Sorry, no, I don't. Trizestery. That's a certain charm. Actually really rather cool, gets very tight. It, uh, the transistor is actually bringing a really nice tightness. Let's see what happens with the op amp. Same thing, but it's not bringing the, the, the extra sort of joy that the transistor is bringing. So hitting that harder than Mr. Auto Game would tell us is adding a a really nice kind of value to that. Is that the sound that people want to hear? Maybe not. Is it the sound they should hear? Maybe. But nonetheless, we can make those decisions across the board 
and then tune. Bear in mind that they've all become this. If I actually, if I pop that back to tube uh, and let's give them a couple of years, now pop this out of the group. Transistor. We do lose some of that spark across the whole mix. Now we're getting some crush because we're pushing into these, so it's not entirely fair. Uh, so some of what we're hearing apparently with the transistor is actually coming from somewhere else down the track. But it's, it's kind of a nice sound in its own way. Is it what I would be doing? Maybe not. Uh, let's pop this back in its group. I'm happy with my levels. I don't want another program to be telling me what my levels should be. I know what my levels are going to be, and this is why I got invented meters. I want this to breathe, so they're okay. I could decide to push a dB. And I'm happy. Again, how you use that is going to be up to you. Where you insert these things in the chain is also going to be up to you. I've got this at the beginning. There is, in theory, no real reason why I can't put it here. But at least for the moment, I kind of like putting it here. Personally, I've often got a couple of other things. Um, some other saturation, because a couple of little layers of saturation at this point, but my mixes tend to run a lot quieter than other people's mixes. Many people's mixes, they drop their first thing in and it's already clipping. I will get to the end of a mix, particularly my personal stuff, and often be at like minus 12 dB. So it means that I've got a lot more flexibility to do things like this. Somebody who started with a super loud mix, and it's not that my mixes can't be loud, but somebody who's pushing or pinning their meters right from the get-go will have some real difficulties with bringing it in and then going, yep, now I'm going to turn that down so that we can work with it. So I have that strategy of don't do it in the first place. And I've got my knob, my volume knob over here. And I know that when I listen to music, the knob goes here. When I am making music or mixing music, my knob goes here. If my knob being here and the mix is too loud, then I'm going to look at it and go, okay, do I want to just pull that knob back a little bit? Or do I really want to be pulling my mix back? Delouding my mix, which is at each of the instruments, not at the masters. My masters never gets touched until it's time to have a fade out at the end. Moving your masters up and down to me is, 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 is a bit of a fail. So that gives me a clear sense of, okay, I've pushed more level out of my speakers, but I'm not changing the level of my mix. And it's going to come in, and it might well come in, as I say, at peaking at about minus 12. And then that gives me a lot of flexibility on what I do with saturators and level units and what I have you on the beginning. If it gets to a point where I need to add level, then I can add it either on the front of something like the compressor, or more likely I'll just add in another one of these guys and say, that'll be 9 dB, thank you very much. Digital is wonderful in this way, in that you can just control exactly what you want your levels to be anywhere in the process. And to me, that is always what the mix wants and what the units around it want, not some arbitrary rule of minus so many db or god forbid luffs so we've gone through a lot if you've watched all four programs here we've gone through a lot we've looked at what saturation is and how it works and how to not fall into the pitfalls or the holes of crossing over too much into distortion um, 
how saturation is there as this magical, almost invisible thing that just embiggens, adds a sense of 3D and definitely in my case a sense of sparkle along with a nice sense of body and punch to, to our mix. Very strongly put it in one place. So if you're using it just on your masters, put it in the same place on your masters for that whole album. Because if you put it in a different place and do something different every time, every single track is not going to match. You'll move from song to song and they won't feel like they're a moment in time. So it's like you're sitting in front of your girlfriend and um, you're having a dinner and, and, and talking about something or other, I mean, the fish or the cat. Uh, and she's wearing a particular outfit. And you say something and then you focus back on her and you go, hang on, you've changed clothes. Hang on, you've changed clothes. And this keeps happening over and over. It's confusing. So pick a path where you're going to put your thing and put it there. Every time, at least for this record. If you're going to put it on every single track, which is ideal, especially with a doohickey like this, with your, with your grouping group, then it either goes, and I'll try and put the graphic up here, instrument, Saturation unit, then your effects. My personal preference is instrument effects. They're your insert effects. So that's your Jupiter 8's been plugged into a Dimension D chorus, which is being plugged into a space echo, which is then plugged into the desk. The desk being the point at which saturation happens, which you see here. So the effects which are part of that synth sound uh, go through the Neve sound. The other way, it just, it seems more doorish to do it that way. This sound that's put in, it's got send going off to our reverb. So that send has this full sound and then the reverb gets that full sound. I just find it a little strange that we would jack into a desk and then be inserting effects. But it's, it's up to you, whichever you do, pick that path and do it consistently uh, through the song or the album, because if you've got some this and some that, you've got a, a discrepancy, which is confusing. If your girlfriend kept changing clothes every time you looked at her, it's only a matter of time before you start to add what's called an interrupt to that conversation, like, why do you keep changing clothes? And that interrupts, and next thing you know, big argument on for young and old, cat gets kicked. It all goes downhill. Don't introduce that confusion. So pick your path and stick to it. That is the world that you have got. Um, I really think that's it. Saturation will initially seem a little confusing for you. If it's confusing, don't do it. Take your time to keep trying to understand it. When you get to that point where you go, then you have started to understand it, and then you use it. If you don't get it, then it's possible you're not even designed to be a mix engineer, just as I am not designed to be a guitarist. God did not give me guitar playing genes. I could spend as long as I wanted trying to play guitar, and I might get passable at it. I asked Jake, uh, my client, um, my friend, uh, who is a guitarist, I said, you know, would you teach me to play guitar? And he's like, oh, yeah. I said, well, would I be any good at it? Oh, given time? I said, no, 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 let's stop being polite. Am I ever going to be as good a guitar player as I am at doing this kind of stuff? And he was like, no. So why should I waste my time being a bad guitar player? No. So if it gets to this point where you go, I, I just, it just never comes, and that's fine, then acknowledge it doesn't come because there's probably something you're good at. If you're good at playing guitar then and good at writing songs, then get it. Maybe learn to track because tracking is not that hard. All you've got to do is get the sound down, and in digital, that's pretty easy because whatever you put into digital should sound exactly like what you've recorded. Once you've gotten how to do that, no brainer, but it doesn't make you a good mix engineer. If you realize that that's where you're not going, don't worry about it. Understand how this stuff works because it's kind of cool because that way you can set up things so that when they come to your mix engineer, as Jake increasingly sets up his mixes and how he composes even, knowing that oh, that's what Benedict's going to do, 
And so when I get it, I do that because I have been led in that direction and boom, we get a much bigger result than we'd have gotten bef without him understanding how it goes. So getting a bit of understanding is good, but feeling you have to be good at this, not good at all. If it comes down to the one I keep hearing over and over, oh, but I don't want to pay anyone. It's like, okay, did you pay for your guitar? Oh yes, I paid five grand so that I got a real American Fender. Why'd you do that? Because it's exceptional. The guitar that you got for $5 from the pawn shop that probably should have been on the dump is not exceptional. doesn't matter what you do to it. It'll never be exceptional. There are ways to make relationships with people, but you have to return value. So if you're getting $5,000 worth of value from that person, like getting a $5,000 worth of guitar from Fender, then make sure you're returning that value. There are ways to create relationships. Really important. You might be going, what's it got to do with saturation? Well, saturation here, and we've got to the end of this, and this is the end of mixing. We've got our piece. It's ready to go out into the world uh, and amaze people. Not everybody, but those few people who go, I like that. That's made my life better today. I'd like to buy that record so that I can put it on and have that record make me feel better tomorrow. Now, if you have questions, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Remember, we've got to always return value. Ask your question. Please don't have it about how to troubleshoot Hornet because I'm not Hornet. You go ask Mr. Hornet that. Uh, but <laughs> I, I can't see anything that, that, that could go wrong with this. It seems really very clear. Uh, but if you're wanting to understand stuff that we've discussed, after you've watched the video and understood the material or gotten as far as you can, write me a, hey, Benedict, when you said this, why that? I thought this, why'd you say that? Or why'd you do that? Or whatever. Then I'm delighted to answer that kind of stuff. Now, in the meantime, Thank you for watching these. Hopefully you have all watched all four of these. I know it's four or so hours of your life, but four hours of your life that teaches you how to do what you do better. Even if you don't become a mix engineer, the hours that Jake spent sitting beside me whilst I do this stuff in front of him and talk to him, it's worth far more than the money that he spent on that time because now when he puts together a song, he's thinking about the next person in the chain, what they're going to want, what they're going to do, and his songs have gotten better. His production has gotten better. His playing, all that stuff has gotten better uh, in that time. So investing some hours into this will pay back tremendously. When I went to a theory teacher, I found a theory teacher. The first person I spoke to said, no, don't come to me to learn to play piano. You're too old, blah, blah. I was like, thank you. Um, I was quite clear. I'm not looking to do anything other than get better at what I do as a composer. And this guy said, okay, fair enough. And he did a pretty good job. He had a tendency to go off and play things. And I, like, I have no idea what you're doing. Sounds nice. Can't tell what you're doing. But nonetheless, at the time, sometimes I was like, I don't know what I've gotten out of this. But then... A month or so later, I'm going, I wrote that. I couldn't have written that before. And even now, things that were in that time that I spent and the money that I spent, I spent 60 an hour, which is very normal for anybody who's a remotely competent piano teacher uh, to get this. I don't know how many, how many lessons that I had, but what I got from that was way beyond any plug-in or two-minute tutorial that I've ever watched. So again, kind of going on a little bit, but this is the this is the word to the wise, and I know that only the wise are watching at one hour and nine seconds in. So you have a great day. If there's a question, pop it below. If you know that you're not cut out to be a mix engineer, don't stop watching these things. Watch them so you learn whilst you're doing something else, you know, whilst you're tuning your guitar or something like that. The information will come back in value. And all the time that you're doing this, make sure that you are having fun. You have a great day.